Hi, welcome to Local Matters. I'm your host, Ken Moore. One of the things we think about in our community constantly is education, education of our children. So I'm delighted to have with me today the superintendent of the Yamhill Carlton School District, Sharan Klein. Sharan, thanks for being here today. Well, thanks for having me, Ken. I appreciate it. coming on. Now, you um, have been in the community for about how long now? Uh, for about three years. I okay. moved up. Uh, my family and I moved up from the Roseburg area. And you were a former teacher? I was. I taught at Flomouth High School for six years. And what were the subjects? Uh, social studies, uh, history, mostly geography, and I did a, what I called a community geography, where I went out and did uh, service learning projects with kids. A lot of experience. So you've come here to Yamhill Carleton from a wide experience. Hmm? Tell us what you saw when you got here. From the outside eyes, how did we appear? Well, yeah, I mean, actually, the, when I first showed up, it was raining like crazy and rained for days, and I thought, well, man, I'm, I've moved to a swamp, <laughs> so it seemed, <laughs> it seemed pretty wet at first, but after it dried up a little bit, uh, I got to know the people, and uh, really, a, really a great group of people that live in this area, uh, very community-focused. Uh, I was surprised at the amount of families that have been here for since Oregon Trail times. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you see so many names that are sort of these German names of people that have come over and homesteaded and, and I thought that was kind of fascinating, kind of different. People have a real real tight history to their community. You know, I, I enjoy that about the community. There's generations of people who know their roots. They, they know how this, the community works mm -hmm. and it works well mm -hmm. that way. Um, and people move in, they they're, they're given a good example. Hmm. Yeah. So you came here to Yamiel Carleton School District. You're suddenly, it's your baby. Right. And you found some strengths. I did. Um, uh, mostly we started with, um, well, actually what I first started doing is we did a giant survey of the school and a, and a long uh, process of kind of really looking at both the strengths and the weaknesses. And what you see in terms of strengths is about the sense of people care about the community. They care about the kids, they want the kids to do well. Um, in some ways our schools um, uh, were mothering the kids a lot, really wanting them to, I mean just really caring about the kids. And that's a good thing, that's a good thing. But it also can lead sometimes to some lack of uh, focus, perhaps discipline and, and standards you know, in terms of student achievement. Okay. So. You came in, you saw some things that uh, were strengths, you saw some things that needed doing. How have you been successful? What do you feel like has gone well in these three years? Well, I think that a big part of the process was really getting the district focused about the work that they needed to do. Um, we spent a good time laying out what the vision should be. Um, we created these things we called operating principles that was very clear about what people's actions should be pretty much in any situation in the in the school and at all times. And we created a list of behaviors we want people to do. Our teachers are working hard to make those ideals into reality. Uh, our custodians work hard. Um, our students are starting to get the idea of what we're trying to do. And uh, what we're trying to do is build a culture of achievement, build a culture of quality going forward, um, where just okay isn't okay. And uh, we really want to create situations where kids are excelling and doing well. And we're, we're just on the cusp of it, and I really expect um, some wonderful results to start happening over the next few years. When I was in your office, there was um, a bullet point list, I think, on my, over my shoulder on the wall. Right, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, what what were, yeah, those were impressive. What were some of those? Well, they're, they're simply things like um, uh, teachers need to teach um, from bell to bell. That um, was it. That right, was meaning, it. meaning that all the time in a school they must be used. You can't waste it. There, there's, no, there's no time for that. Um, saying that we need to be using higher order thinking strategies with kids. Kid, they, kids need to be able to, to reason. They need to be able to analyze and think and write. Um, simply uh, you know, spouting out the answer when the teacher asks the question isn't good enough. Uh, there's pieces in there about uh, behavior. We, we don't allow misbehavior. Uh, we make sure that we're right on top of it. But we try to encourage good behavior through positive reinforcement. Um, there's a whole list of things. Yeah, I that's to a go good through all of them, but they're good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I, the, when you said bell to bell, teaching bell to bell, that brings up something that I've felt in schools lately. Um, there's a sense of urgency. Sure. Every day counts. Every now you're saying every minute counts mm -hmm. in the classroom. That I don't remember that intensity when I went to school. Sure. Um, what What do you think's behind that, and how is that playing out in the in your school district? I think. Uh, ultimately, if you look at it, it's about the global marketplace. It's about the idea that our kids living in Yamhill, Oregon, 
in reality are entering a world that in 10 years they're going to have 10 billion people in it. And those 10 billion people are competing for resources and jobs. Uh, and we as a, as a nation and as a country are competing against all those folks. Our kids have to go out there and be able to compete, do well, um, so our country can prosper, so they individually can prosper. And um, there just isn't time to waste uh, with, with you know, people just uh, not being focused. Really, they, they've got to get skilled. They've got to get on it. And we've got to get them out into the world so they can really, you know, make, make this a better society to live in. Now, you came, um, you know, we have some challenges in Yamhill Carleton. Sure. And I know some of those are statistical. <laughs> can you talk about some of the statistics that are working against us? Well, Yamhill Carleton uh, is an interesting place. It's a place where um, a lot of folks in Yamhill live out in the hills, if you will, and, and they live out there because... I'm one of them. There you go. And a lot of folks live out there because they don't really want anybody to talk to them. They want to kind of do their own thing, and that's, a, that's an important part of being an Oregonian and being, a, being an American, to be able to do your own thing out there. Um, but um, it creates a situation where census-wise, we um, show ourselves having a very low poverty rate. Which low in, poverty low rate. Low poverty rate, which, which you know, normally would be a good thing, right? But when you we're working with some of our students, um, it's very clear that that low poverty rate that we have, because we've got so many people living on, on land, I suppose, that's, that's worth quite a bit of money, um, it, it, um. We, it limits the amount of resources that we get for kids. Uh, we don't necessarily some, some of us get those extra resources that we need. It's a, very, um, it's a community that's very white. Um, in some ways, it's very middle class, and we're unable to get uh, either resources uh, from the state or grants sometimes to help us help ourselves. Uh, and, and it creates a real problem with, with um, getting extra resources to the kids who need it. So, uh, let's see, the poverty rate is, for example, lower than McMinnville. It is. So Title I funds are affected by that poverty Title rate. I funds are affected by that. Um, when I was a superintendent in North Douglas School District down in, down in Douglas County, which is about a third the size of Yamhill Carleton, we got around $250,000 in Title I funds. Um, next year, I'm going to get $85,000 in Title I funds. And we're three times the size. We're three times the size. And it won't even pay for a single teacher, um, you know, salary benefits, the whole thing. It won't even pay for a single teacher to work with kids to help improve their reading. So it's a, it's a real detriment. So that, those statistics are hurting the funding that we're getting as they compared are. to McMinnville, for example. Yes, for sure. A big difference. Yep. I, even though there's probably very little difference in the need. Right. That's true. Okay. And speaking of need, that does bring up something that I know that is different here uh, in McMinnville, the infrastructure in Yamhill Carlton. Maybe you could talk just briefly about our three different sites. Sure. Well, we've got three schools. Um, as you probably know, originally the three schools in Yamhill Carleton were three separate school districts. They uh, they merged. Well, I don't know. Maybe only only maybe ten or fifteen years ago, they merged into one school district and brought their brought their base together. Um, the buildings themselves were built over time. Uh, they were built in in uh, stages. The high school was built in 1936 uh, as a WPA project. Um, and it has been updated since then multiple times, but it's got old brick in it, old infrastructure, old mortar. Our facilities in general are, are falling apart. Um, as they were built, um, they're all ending or past their useful lifespan. Um, uh, there, there are many community members who would like me to tear them all down and start over, and I, I would like nothing better. Uh, well, it's up the high school. It's kind of kind of a pretty architectural thing, but I'd like to repair that one. But the, but some of the other buildings, unfortunately, the amount of money that our school district could actually raise from the community is is well below what what all that is. Um, we would need probably seventy million dollars to replace all the schools. Uh, and as you know, we just tried to pass a bond for twenty three million, and it was going to cost the taxpayers uh, two dollars and twenty nine cents a thousand which is, you know, a fair amount of, of money. And so something in that range is just simply not possible. Um, but we do need to repair the buildings, and soon um, they are um, costing us money out of their general fund that we're using for repair all the time that we could be using to buy textbooks and, and uh, pay for, you know, computers and paper and all the different things that we need. So how do you see the future of um, the middle school and the elementary school, or is that just something that needs more study? 
as far as how each of these buildings is going to be used, updated, remodeled, expanded? Well, we've done a lot of studies on them. Um, we're going to do we're going to do a survey pretty soon, asking the community what they're interested in doing. I came up with a plan of, a little while back to uh, actually tear down our middle school and convert our high school to a 712 and our elementary school move it from a K4 that it is now to a K6, which I think would be a great. Um, um, educationally, it would work better. How we move, work with the kids um, would work better. How I use my staff would work better. Problem is, it ends up being a $35 million solution. And it just simply isn't, isn't doable. Uh, we'll probably try and pass a bond sometime in the near future to uh, repair what we have, perhaps build another gymnasium. Um, the gymnasium we space that we have in the district was all built before Title IX existed. And Title IX, as you know, was the, the law that gave equal time to both boys and girls uh, doing athletics. Um, and so we literally have half the space that we need. Um, so it's a, it's a problem. So going forward with this bond measure, um, it sounds like you're scaling back if you're going to build a gymnasium and do some do some maintenance. That's what I heard. Well, I'm going to ask the community what they want to do. Yeah. If the community's interested in in raising the money um, to do something larger, then I'm all for it. Okay. Um, the response we got after the last bond, most of the information I've heard, most of my informal surveying, tells me that people aren't interested in that. Now, there is a very sizable and loud group that says, no, we just need to tear it all down and start over. Uh -huh. um, but but those people haven't seen how that's going to impact their taxes yet. So, we have a. I think the reason the gymnasium comes up is because the gym will no longer be uh, able to host uh, basketball games. Well, it can host basketball games, but it's it, the OSAA regulations right. ask for ten feet of runoff right. on each side of the gym. We have eighteen inches on one side, and we kind of have it kind of narrows down to a point the way it was built. Um, it hasn't happened yet. Uh, in the future, though, the OSAA could um, implement the regulations and say, hey, we're not going to play any more state games here, yeah. uh, you know, state playoff games, for instance. That okay. could be a possibility. They'd much more like, be more likely to do that than it would be to say, you can't play in your gym at all um, because where would we play? You know, what, what would we do? And so um, the OSAA is powerful, but they're not that powerful. So. Okay, okay. Well, that's good to hear. Um, so there, you're, you're funding, you're commissioning a study to yes. see what the best way to make use of the facilities we have. Well, it's, it's more about what are people interested in, in supporting. Okay. Okay. What, what do they want to support? Now, a concern I've heard you voice is that the maintenance as it is now, when it's not coming from a bond measure, is coming from operating funds? That's correct. It's coming from money that would normally be used to buy textbooks? It could be, yeah. And what are some of the other needs that this, that this maintenance that's ongoing without, without a bond measure is taking away from? Oh. Where are you, where are you <laughs> well, feeling that? You can name I mean, textbooks is, is the easiest thing to talk about okay. simply because we have textbooks in our, um, all throughout our system that are, that are 10, 15 years old, that are literally falling apart. Uh, I have parents bring us our eighth grade science books every so often and say, hey, look, here's where I wrote my name in the science book. And uh, it's an amazing how old it is, to the point that our, our teachers just sort of make, you know, they have to make up their own curriculum as they're going through it, uh, which can be rough. Um, so we're working on things all the time. We're supplementing. Uh, but if I had, had the, uh, the money, um, I'd simply buy a, a good set of textbooks for folks to work with, high-level work. Um, gives our teachers and our students a great place to start from in terms of building their curriculum and their knowledge going forward. That'd be one place to put the money. Uh, technology is, is an easy place. Uh, technology is a little bit of a black hole of funding because you can just keep dumping money into it. But we have old computers all over the place. We're just trying to keep going. Uh, most of the computers we have in the building are donated from somebody else. Uh, I think PSU was getting uh, upgrading there, so we got their old stuff. Um, the vast majority of what we have in the, in the school district is sort of hand-me-downs um, that we try and keep struggling to keep going. That's an easy place to put money. Um, like I said, even, even if we were able to pass the bond to fix a good chunk of what we have, none of it would get all of it. And mm -hmm. so main, more maintenance money would have to go into repairing other parts. Uh, we have a building right now that operates as our maintenance shed, our maintenance building, and it's condemned. Uh, you know, we're trying to figure out how to do something else and tear it down because it's just, it's, it's an eyesore and, and, uh, and in place where mold growing, all kinds of horrible things. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it's not good. So, I want to talk about something that I saw as sure. a real asset when I was um, working in high school. 
uh, volunteering there as an Aspire counselor. And that was the respect that I felt between the students and the teachers. Mm -hmm. I was just so uh, enthusiastic about the relationships that were there, and I think it's a great culture. Mm -hmm. And um, I feel good about that when I drive by the school, that I know that the relationships there are, are powerful and that that will help learning, uh, teaching yeah. and learning take place. Well, Sharan, it's um, been great to have you on the show today, and uh, I really appreciate you coming over here. I know there's a sense of urgency you need to be there, but thank you for, this is important, I think, to talk to the community and inform them. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Ken. Thanks for having me. For joining us with Local Matters. Thank you.